although I am the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Father, would you give that grace again this morning? Would you unfold for us the riches of your Son? And would you give us grace to live that which you plant into our lives? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit down. Good morning. Or as Paul would say, grace and peace to you. The, uh, didn't see a lot of you at the 100 hours gig at half ten last night. We really mustn't let these young people think they're the only ones who are allowed to enjoy loud music. But uh, never mind, you know, the, your stamina will grow through uh, spring harvest. Uh, Right, the next bit of all of Ephesians in four mornings or the second minute of London to Brighton in four minutes, if you prefer. Uh, a reminder, first of all, a little reminder of yesterday. Ephesians is a big picture letter. Incidentally, every time Ephesians talks about the church, it talks about the universal church, God's purpose for his church everywhere. Uh, but the challenge is it's got to be cashed out in the local church or it doesn't happen at all. Uh, a letter about who Christians are, their identity. A letter about why Christians are, their purpose, especially their corporate purpose. And then a a question about how Christians live that we will get on to particularly the next two days, their lifestyle. And that text that we will come to today that I think spells it out beautifully, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. The great emphasis of the passage we're looking at today is a reminder that Christianity is personal and corporate. I, I, I tell you one word that does not fit with the Christian faith at all. It's individual. <laughs> Christian faith is personal. The uh, David Duplessy, the great Pentecostal leader, used to have this lovely saying that God has no grandchildren. <laughs> We are personally, and in that sense individually, sons and daughters of God through Christ. The South African writer David Bosch wrote that Christianity that does not begin with the individual, does not begin personally, does not begin. And now that's where we ended yesterday. That's chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. That's the, uh, the individual that's saved by grace. But you see, we're not just individuals, we're persons, and persons are made for relationship with one another and with God. So Bosch continued, Christianity that ends with the individual, ends. And that's chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, where we begin today. You've just caught on to this wonderful gift of being a new creation in Christ, created in him to do the good works that he's prepared for you to do to make a difference in his world. And immediately, and for the whole of today's Bible reading and into tomorrow's, we are plunged into the corporate business of being a Christian. It's corporate Christianity. It's the Christianity of a community that we're dealing with today. And I want to start by giving you a quick outline of that corporate focus in Ephesians. Because if we just do it day by day, I don't think you'll see the developments. Uh, the scene was set in chapter 1. Then personal salvation is chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, where we ended yesterday. Then we come into the first part of today's passage, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. And it's corporate, it's God's new human race, one new humanity in Christ. And the church is the new human race, and by the end of the chapter, that's transitioned into another image. The church is corporately God's temple. That's a corporate picture before it's an individual one. That new human race that is the living flesh and blood temple of the living God in chapter 3 is to be filled with all the fullness of God. And again, it's corporate. It's with all the saints. 
that you can only grasp how high and deep and wide and so on is the love of God. You, we are, were not made to have the capacity to grasp that alone. We are meant for one another as much as we are meant for God. And all his fullness is a corporate experience, not an individual one. And that one new humanity filled with all the fullness of God, which is, is just unpacking the end of chapter 1, his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Remember the last verse of chapter 1? That new humanity is the body of Christ, the physical flesh and blood presence of Jesus on the earth, chapter 4, verse 1 to 16. So no wonder... Paul says, well, if all that's lots true, we'd better look at how we relate to one another, hadn't we? And godly relationships is 4.17 to 6.9. And then the epistle draws to an end with that great passage about spiritual warfare and the armor of God. But can I say to you, in advance of the fourth Bible reading, that I don't think Paul is primarily talking about individual Christians with their swords and shields and breastplates and sandals. I think he is saying the one new human race filled with God's fullness that is the body of Christ on earth for whom therefore a whole quality of relationships is vital corporately wears the armor of God. <laughs> That's a foretaste of two days time, okay? It's not that you're not allowed to have your own armor but you have it within the corporate body. So do you see this clear strand the whole way through the rest of the letter? It's the corporate church, it's the community that is critical. And uh, years ago now, the writer Howard Snyder, in a book based on uh, Ephesians primarily, wrote this, men and women may be genuinely converted, even taught to be disciples, but if they are not formed into the community of God's people, God's plan for the church remains unfulfilled. Because the way God is going to bring all things unto one, under one head, Jesus Christ, remember that's the purpose of the church from, uh, and the purpose of God's salvation from chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Uh, that happens through a visible community in every place. So that sets the scene. Now, the menu for this morning, it's a bit easier to do this passage than, than yesterday's. Uh, there's four headings. The church created, the church's ministry, the church's purpose, and the church's resources. And before you get too worried, I won't be spending an equal amount of time on each of those. Now, before we go any further, Ephesians is about the universal church, but that has to be lived out in your church. So, will you pause for a moment, and will you bring into mind the people who are Christians with you at St. Blogs or Biggles Block Community Church or wherever it is that you come from? This passage is about God's purpose for you. Because otherwise we have this wonderful high view of the church and we suddenly realize we worship every Sunday with ragtag and bobtail. <laughs> this is grace because this is what God wants to use ragtag and bobtail. And even more amazing, you <laughs> to be for his purposes. This is not high and lofty theology. This is the community of Christ where you live. Let's begin now with the church created. There's an issue that provides the backdrop and the foreground to chapter 2, verse 11 through to the end of that chapter. It's a stark issue. It's the reality of sin and of evil. It's the backdrop because that's what the world is like. It's the foreground because that's the reality that we actually deal with in ourselves and in our communities from day to day. This is not an ideal picture of a church for an ideal world. This is 
God's great vehicle of salvation in a world marked by sin and evil. The profound reality of sin underlies the whole of chapter 2. There's a reminder from yesterday of our lost state. Verse 11, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants, without hope and without God in this world. Think of some of the expressions in the whole chapter, some from the start of chapter, start of chapter 2. Dead in transgressions and sins, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, children of wrath, aliens, foreigners, no hope and without God, far off. The church is brought into a being out of a reality in which sin is deep-rooted, pervasive behavior whose spiritual consequences is drastic. <laughs> and God takes people like that and turns them into a community of hope for people who are still like that. And if those of us who have been surprised and won by God's extraordinary mercy sometimes find it hard for our behavior to change accordingly, and we struggle to be the people that we are, we shouldn't be surprised. You see, the horror of, rea of sin and evil is that it seems normal. Paul said in yesterday's passage, you were just following the desires and thoughts of your sinful nature, doing what comes naturally. There is nothing so spiritually deadly as common sense apart from Christ. <laughs> the world is not populated with people who are consciously wicked. This passage says it's populated with dead people doing what seems common sense. <laughs> And yet what they're doing so often is evil in the sight of God. The consequences are deadly. Verse 3 of yesterday's passage, we were by nature objects of wrath. The heart of it is disobedient. Verse 2, those who are disobedient. It's the failure to become for, of the obedience of faith to serve the living God. This is the heart of the matter. And at the consequence, bringing it back into our passage, without hope, and without God in this world. And it seems to me that of, of all cultures in the world at the moment, the one that most tangibly lacks hope is actually the Western one. There is sometimes extraordinary hope in situations of the most devastating poverty. And I heard someone talking on the news this morning about the uh, young... Muslim men who have been uh, arrested and it looks as though we're planning a bombing campaign uh, in London and saying what no one is asking is what is it about the lack of direction and the lack of values in our society that makes people like that so empty and so cynical and look for some other sort of answers. Without hope and without God isn't a, a general thing about the last judgment. It's actually about the way our society lives. And the church is called to be the community in each locality that gives reason for hope. That's what we're there for. We are signs of God's future. But sin, you see, has social consequences. It just does not just divide you from God. Those who sin against God also sin against one another. So instead of the peace, shalom, remember, is all relationships right and joy within it. In a fallen world, relationships are constantly vulnerable and often broken. And instead of peace with one another, there is hostility. Look at verse 14. It speaks of the dividing wall of hostility. The social consequences of sin are that it divides. It introduces ways of speaking to one another with contempt. Verse 11. Formerly you are Gentiles by birth, called 
uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. You see, Israel as God's people with the distinctive covenant mark of circumcision was meant to be a people who were the light to the nations, gave hope to all, and to whom the nations would flow to find the living God. Instead, they developed an arrogance about being the only ones who were right and began to despise and hate those who were not Jewish, were not of the people of God. And of course, with a history of God using pagan nations to bring them under judgment, that hostility got sharper and sharper. So when Paul talks about those called uncircumcised, it, Paul was a right-wing Pharisee. He would have spat when he said that word. It was a hatred word. It was a not us word. It was a thank God we are not like that word. Sin has social consequences. It leads to contempt rather than love, or fear rather than love, of those who are not like you. And the knowledge of our eternal salvation in Jesus is not meant to make us hateful or contemptuous of anyone. It's to make us love them fully whether they respond to the gospel or not and long that we should be able to share with them what we have found. Aliens is another word that uh, comes in here. Uh, verse 12, for, excluded from citizenship foreigners to the covenant and then that little bit further down verse 19 no longer followers and aliens not one of us and how many of our churches actually put up a barrier that says you're not like us <laughs> therefore you're not really welcome unless you change to become like us. There is a dividing wall in this passage, which is the law of God. It's quite extraordinary. The gift of the way, the very law, which people, the Old Testament said, were to flock to Jerusalem to learn. That the, the way the people of God in the Old Testament lived was to make pagans thirsty to live like that. And of course, some came. Uh, some came, and people like Cornelius in the New Testament are God-fearers. They've not joined the covenant community yet, but there's something about the values and way of life of God's people that's attracted them. It's not that it didn't happen at all, but actually, the marks of the law, the things that made the people of God distinctive, were not an invitation sign, they became a keep out sign with the impression that here were people who knew they were better than you. And, and a distinction that God gave as a vehicle for the salvation of everyone became a label that put people beyond grace. The law itself became the dividing wall and a very subject of hostility. And God dealt with it once for all in Christ. Verse 16, in this one body, reconciling Jew and Gentile to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. God through Christ did not only restore us to himself, he restored us to one another. And he demonstrated that by breaking down the great divide from the perspective of, of God's kingdom that existed, the divide between Jew and Gentile. And there is two levels of this passage. Part of it is simply describing that great moment in salvation history that allowed, I guess, just about the vast majority of us, Gentiles, to become part of the Israel of God. But part of it is an ongoing principle that the moment the 
wonderful privilege that we have in Christ turns into a way to define and demean and fear others and put keep out signs, it's as though we are undoing the very work of the cross itself. So it's a challenge every day. And Paul will take that on in tomorrow's passage in chapter 4, verse 32. He speaks of forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. And that gracious forgiveness, that seeking for reconciliation, needs to work through in the life of the church and in the life of the church's relationships to everyone in the community. The, the pervasiveness and seriousness of sin is lived out among us in the quality or otherwise of our relationships in the church and in the community. And there was only one way that sin could be dealt with, whether it is the penalty of sin that we deserve or whether it is the consequences of sin in broken relationships. The cross is the only answer. Verse 13, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, who's made the two one and destroyed the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility. And verse 16, in this one body to reconcile both Jew and Gentile to God through the cross. See, the great thing about the cross is it's the place where we're all wrong. <laughs> Our arguments with one another are largely about who's right, but you come together at the foot of the cross of Jesus, and one thing unites us all. We're all in need of mercy. <laughs> the cross is the great leveler. And up to that point in this passage, Paul, who is mainly writing to Gentiles and is getting to see the wonder that they are now included in Israel, suddenly stops just addressing them. And he addresses his fellow Jewish people in Christ as well and says, Christ came, verse 17, and preached peace to you who were far away, Gentiles, and peace to those who were near. Not just peace with God, but all relationships restored and that both meet at the foot of the cross. And though in one sense the Gentiles are being included in the great glorious inheritance of God's people, in another and much more radical sense, Jew and Gentile start again together at the foot of the cross of Jesus. And that through Christ and his cross, both have access to the Father by the Spirit. This happens through the blood of Christ, verse 13. Blood always meaning the death of Christ and always referring back to the sacrificial system, the sacrifice of Christ's life for us on the cross. Making peace, shalom does not come cheap. And Christ himself, verse 14, is our peace who has made the two one. Peace-making. Isn't it interesting that in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called sons or children of God. Why? Because the Son of God was to make peace by offering himself on the cross. Uh, uh, one of the rabbis used to tell the parable of the cooking pot when illustrating this thing about peacemakers, he said the cooking pot has this wonderful gift. It brings together two totally irreconcilable things, fire and water. And it comes between them and as it were contains the water and takes the heat and turns the combination into something that can nourish everyone. <laughs> Now, there's a beautiful picture of peacemaking there, getting between those with whom there is hostility and in somehow being the one who can bring them together. But please understand the costliness of it. The model of it is that Christ bore the heat of our sin and our brokenness and our fear of people who are not like us dealt with it once for all on the cross so that we can live in those new reconciled relationships. The, we are reconciled. The work of Christ reconciles one with another. 
bringing Gentiles into the covenant with Israel. Hostility is overcome, not just because hostility is a bad thing, but because reconciliation is always the intention. And God's new human race is a result of a double reconciliation. We are reconciled to God and to one another. Now, do you understand why Christianity is personal, but it's essentially corporate? I'm terribly sorry, but if you've got Jesus, you're stuck with me. You can't have the Father without the brothers and sisters. You can't have the bit of the relationship without the family. And what we'll see in a moment is the way the family lives on earth, is the, dem the, the way we demonstrate that, we, that churches are full of people who would never be together if it wasn't for Jesus. And there's room in them for loads of people who aren't like them because Jesus makes reconciliation. The, the fruit of the cross in our relationships is the visible demonstration on the earth and actually in heaven of the fruit of the cross restoring us to God. The one is, as it were, the proof, the demonstration of the other. So what about the fruit of the cross? The fruit of the cross in verse 15 is a new human race. His purpose was to create in himself one new man, one new human being out of the two. New Adam, if you like. New first, he himself is the new first human. But the cross brings together two alienated peoples and begins a new human race by being them together. Cre he created in himself. This is the new creation. Folks, you are the human race that is created for the new heaven and the new earth. But you live out that reality in the old heaven and the old earth in advance. You're a taste of God's future. You are the people of the future, the new human race, the third race, if you like, in Christ, that, tra that is transcending all differences. Through him, we both have access to the Father. You're no longer foreigners, aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. A new human race, a new citizenship, and a new family to belong to. Do you remember all that stuff about adoption? All through Christ because he is our peace. Church is something else. It's not just those funny people you sit next to in your pews or your seats. Or <laughs> The church is God's human race. The church is... God's household, members of God's household, verse 19. Now, the, the Greek words are necessary here. Household, oikos. Do you remember chapter 1? God's got a plan, an economy, oikonomia. Here's the plan. Here's the family that puts the plan into action. It's not... Being God's household isn't just about belonging to him and having the relationships. It's about sharing in the family purpose, bringing everything under Christ's authority. And this household is also God's temple. In him also, the whole building joined together, is joined together. It rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. The, te the church as the temple of God is essentially a corporate picture. We are the temple. Every time but one when Paul says, don't you know that you're God's temple, it, the you is plural. Once he says in 1 Corinthians, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, so glorify God in your body. And as it were, he applies our being the temple to us individually. And I think the same applies to the armor picture. But what's a temple? It's the location of God's presence in the community. 
It's the place where true worship is held. It's God's alternative to all the other places. Remember, this is a letter to the Ephesians. Do you remember in Acts a great crowd rioting and crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians, because she wasn't too great because her idol makers were being put out of business by people becoming Christians. <laughs> the alternative temple. And this temple, this household, both images, the house and the house of God, is founded on the scriptures, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and only the scriptures, because the scriptures point to Christ, Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And this glorious new humanity, household of God, temple of the living God, includes you. Verse 22, and in him, you too, and I don't mean the band, are being built together. You are being built together, become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's the church's creation. That's utterly glorious. And now, much more briefly, we can follow on with the easier passage that follows and talk about, first of all, the church's ministry. Let me read you verses 3 to 6 for a moment. See, this is Saul's surprise. Yes, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. I know by now he's writing this is Paul the Apostle, but why on earth should he believe the things that he does? Saul's surprise is that the Gentiles are heirs together with Christ. As a right-wing Pharisee, he would never have believed that. Uh, let me read verses 3 to 6. That, that is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I've already written briefly. In reading this, you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which wasn't known to men in other generations, as it's now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Now, here's the key thing. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. So all the stuff we've been looking at in this last section that is Jew and Gentile together one new humanity that Paul says is the distinctive and new revelation which God gave him that's the heart of his special message that equips him to be an apostle to the Gentiles now why should this happen I need to take you back to the Damascus Road the first piece of evidence was the resurrection of Christ. Paul on the Damascus Road did not claim that he had a vision of Jesus. He claimed that he encountered the risen Jesus. He appeared to me. It says, out of time, it should have happened. It's after the ascension. Paul had a resurrection appearance like that that Peter and John and Mary Magdalene did. And But you see, it sent his mind a spinning because Paul believed that the resurrection was a thing for all God's people at the end of history. But if God had raised up one that therefore must be the Messiah in the middle of history, all the things that were meant to happen with the resurrection could start happening now. And then do you remember, Paul is led by the hand because he's lost his sight and he goes to Straight Street and a very scared, mustn't give the other talk I've got on this, a very scared apostle called, you know, called Ananias, a disciple called Ananias goes along and prays for him that he may receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you see, many Jews believed that the, the great time of the Spirit had ended and that the... the that, if you like, the final pouring out of the Spirit would only be when the Messiah came. And suddenly he, like the prophets and judges of old, is filled with the Spirit of the living God. And if God was pouring out his Spirit in the middle of history, then maybe some of the things that were meant to happen at the end of history, he thought, actually were going to happen in the middle of history. And that meant all that stuff about the Gentiles. And that meant that it wasn't that at the last day the Gentiles would indeed come to Zion and would kneel before the Jews and say, you were right, we will serve you. We're so sorry for oppressing you. 
It meant that the Gentiles would come in and kneel alongside the Jews at the foot of the cross of Jesus to serve the risen Lord and be part of his people. Now, it took him several years working out the implication, but the fact of meeting the risen Lord and the fact of being filled with the Spirit in the middle of history turned his whole history around. And if all that's totally new to you, read a little book called What St. Paul Really Said by Tom Wright. It is on the bookstore here, been republished recently. What St. Paul Really Said by Tom Wright. So Saul's surprise turned into Paul's ministry. And that's why his unique insight was about the Gentiles, and that's why Jesus equipped him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that's why we're here, folks. It's not just history. It's rather good news. So verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by God's grace, given to me through the working of his power. Though I'm less than the least of all God's people, I persecuted them for goodness sake, he says in other places, as it were. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't think in the whole of his life on earth, Paul overcame the sense of wonder that this was for everyone now. <laughs> and you should never, ever take that for granted. <laughs> It should be amazement to you that you are in Christ. And if you can be in Christ, then just maybe your neighbors could as well. Just maybe those people you find are hostile to you or you fear them, they could be as well. Just, you know. <laughs> it's Paul's ministry and ours. Verse 2, this grace was given to me for you. <laughs> Ministry is to multiply. Grace is given to give away. Surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. I've got great news for you, everybody. We are all administrators. <laughs> now, I know some people who can organize the life out of anything, but it's not what I mean. Look, verse, administrators of grace. Verse 2, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me. Verse 9, to make plain to everyone the administration of this ministry. We are, what's an administration? It ties into this economy and household bit. Each household, to run its economy, had a steward. Often a slave, sometimes who had been made free, or even sometimes adopted, who the father trusted with all his resources to do the business. And Paul says, it's amazing, I'm the least of all the saints, but I've been made a household steward. Folks, so have you. You are stewards of the household of grace, trusted with the master's riches, with stewards of the grace we have received. They are given to us to be put to use. And, and if you want a, another image of the church, not a biblical one, but to try and explain this, think of the church as a prism. Prism, not prison. I know some are like that too, but... Uh, right. Think of white light... Think back to school a long time ago for some of us, I know, but hang in there. White light on a prism breaks up into the colors of the rainbow. So the overall gift of the glorious grace of God breaks up into distinctive gifts of grace for specific bits of ministry. So Paul talks about, the, you know, the overall extraordinary riches of, and grace of God. And then he suddenly says, this grace. I, Paul, became a servant of the gospel by God's gift of grace. Verse 8, though I'm the least of all God's people, this grace was given to me. And that means a particular gifting. Uh, grace is practical. It is God's equipping of you, his servants, to do his work. And the wonderful general grace of God becomes the specific gifting and equipping of each Christian. 
uh, charis grace, charisma from which we get charismatic, gift of grace. The Holy Spirit is grace made tangible. The gifts of the Spirit are grace applied. Someone once said a, a, a spiritual gift is any word or action that embodies grace. So as you use the gifts God has given you, grace touches other people. You receive grace for others. Just as Paul said, he, he was given grace for you. And to quote my good friend, Brother Bernard, from yesterday, it's all gift. The church's ministry is to receive the grace of God and to give it away in tangible, practical ways according to the gifting that God has given you. And the church's purpose is extraordinary. It has a purpose that impacts the earth, the purpose on earth. That was at the end of chapter 1. It's his body filling everything in every way. So my question was, where are you? What bit of your community and its life are not the people of God where you are touching? But it's also his purpose in heaven. Chapter 3, verse 10. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first purpose of the earth is to be the tangible presence of Christ in every place, that every place can be an encounter with grace. The second purpose is to rub God's wisdom in the face of the demons. Rulers and authorities, certainly the way it's used in chapter 6, is about the powers of darkness, the spiritual realities that are still in the heavenly places. How on earth does the church make God's wisdom known to the demons? I mean, think about it for a minute. Your job is to make the demons tremble. Now, I want to be honest with you. I've heard some very daft stuff about spiritual warfare. And I will hold my gunfire back on that until the last morning when we're in chapter 6. But, but you know, you know when, when, when my good friend J. John was a young Christian, he heard all these talks. He used to put YBH against point after point in its notes. Yes, but how? <laughs> how does the church make God's wisdom known to the powers of darkness? I think the answer is actually simple, by being a reconciled community on earth. Just by being the people that God intended you to be. Listen to one of the commentators. It's not by preaching nor by worship, but by its very existence as the one new human race that the church reveals to the hostile powers that their divisive regime is at an end. Satan loves to divide. When we live out reconciled relationships as the fruit of the cross and reach out in love to our neighbor, however hostile they might on some occasions be to us, we simply say to the demons, it's over. It's done. The hostility is overcome. It's being reversed. Your time is nearly up. And we don't have to stomp around and wave our fist at heaven or do anything like that. You don't have to do prayer walks for this, though I believe in prayer walks about the transformation of communities on earth. All you have to do to make the demon shake is live out the fruit of the cross. Because you're not showing them what you can do, you're showing them what Christ has done. And that is their doom. It's, the church serves as a reminder and a pledge of the overcoming of all divisions when the universe is restored to harmony by her very existence as a new humanity in which the major division of the first century world or the major divisions of the 21st century world. <laughs> Thank God that in South Africa, in the Philippines, in large parts of Eastern Europe, 
It was the people of God, despite the fact that in some of those places they'd also got it terribly wrong, who were central to the breaking down of hostility. Let in our day that give hope to us for the new and appalling hostilities that now mark our world. It's all based on Christ's achievement. Verse 11, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the church has a role in the visible and in the invisible world. And it's all available to us. We can live it out now because we have access to God. It comes by access to God. Verse 12, in in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Uh, maybe you live in a community where Western origin person and Muslim is living in real hostility. Now, I believe Christ is the only way of salvation, but I also believe the love of Christ can break down any hostility in the community. In our post 9-11 world, Let's take enormous hope from this. Jesus Christ destroys hostility by grace. And Paul says, I ask you, therefore, don't be discouraged by the fact that I can't live this corporate Christian life in the moment. I am stuck by myself, chained to a soldier. <laughs> but it's all right. It's for your glory. The God we cannot see strengthens us in any sufferings we experience in the world that we can see. Let's conclude, and if you have to go and get a child, do please go. You won't, you won't embarrass me. Let's conclude with the church's resources. This part that we said together. Do note the how wide, how long, how high, how deep. The church's resources begin with prayer. Paul is about to list what he longs for, but he's not going to tell them what he longs for. He's telling them that he's praying the Father that that's what they will have. I kneel before the Father. It's through prayer, through access to God, that we seek. See, it's all paid for. The cross has won it all for you. You have access now. Don't hold back wondering if God is mealy-mouthed and will give. God has given. Go in faith and confidence and boldness to receive, but humbly kneel before the Father. He's your Lord and your God. The church's resources begin in prayer, but they're for the sake of the world. Uh, we all cheerfully read out of our nearly infallible versions, which is wrong in verse 15. <clears throat> Every major commentary I've read says it should read, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its names. I think it therefore means the angels as well as the humans. But it's every family, not his whole family. No, we do belong to his whole family. That's glorious. It's true. It's just not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, I mean, have you got the message? The church is for the world. <laughs> it's got a job to do in the world. So as you cry out to the Lord for his resources, you do so knowing that he has a rightful claim. He is the origin of the life of every family in your community. <laughs> And this stuff is for you, for them. It's grace for you, for them. It's a reminder that it's not for you. I, I, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember a great leader of the South American Missionary Society, Canon Harry Sutton. And I remember Harry preaching once on a little verse from Job. It's one of Job's many reasons where if he'd done something, God was right to, would have been right to judge him. And it was, if I had eaten my morsel alone... <laughs> You can't hold on to the riches of God. They're like manna. They go off if you keep them for yourself for tomorrow. The resources of God are for the families of the earth and to demonstrate the reality of God to the families in heaven. It's wonderful. 
So it's the church's potential, his glorious riches, says Paul, his power, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Folks, just one thing. Power is Christ-shaped. When you pray for the power of God, don't think what you think is power, you know, Superman Christians, power oozing out of your fingers. The Christian model of power is Jesus. And Jesus exercised his power by giving himself up and going to the cross. And God raised and exalted him. And that's the way power works in the Christian life. It's, it's actually a prayer that you might have the sort of grace to lay down your life for others that Christ did in laying down his life for you. And therefore it goes straight on to talk about love, that you may be rooted and established in love and may have power, there it is again, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that love that surpasses knowledge. Never separate your understanding of power from the character of Christ. There is a difference between the love of power and the power of love. And Paul says maturity is possible. You may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. You're meant to be the church, his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So keep seeking God for more of him for others so you can be that. It's not, I am filled with the fullness of God. <laughs> it's, Lord, I need more of you to show more of you to them. It's an outward looking. It's, it's Lord, you gave yourself for me. Give to me for them. That's the whole thing. And it ends up beyond imagination. Filled that he can fill everything in every way. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to the great power that's at work within us. That passage is in there to stop you getting complacent. Because if everything happened in your church that you could possibly imagine, you've only dipped into what God can do. It's a call to an enlargement of vision in the light of the grace of Christ. God's plan is of cosmic scale. The church's privilege is to have a central plan a central place in God's cosmic plan. On earth, to be his body filling everything in every way. In heaven, that his wisdom may be known to the rulers and authorities and the powers of darkness forever. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Folks, not only do you have this extraordinary privilege of being caught up in God's purposes for the world, you in him do stuff that lasts forever. And that is the only stuff worth doing. Amen? There's some good stuff to take you into the rhythms of grace for this day. We've just got into the rhythm of it, and we can continue through the day. Don't forget to check the screens before you leave for the uh, notices of the day. And uh, before we do that, let's pray together before we separate. Let's take just a brief moment to ask the Lord to impress upon our minds, our hearts, and our spirits that word, spoken generally this morning which was particularly for us and for our circumstances. Father, we thank you that grace is everywhere and for everybody. We pray that we may link into that word which was ours this morning, that we may live in the benefit of it and the blessing of it, 
and we may share it with others as opportunity occurs in the hours and days that lie ahead. As we are here, we commend to your grace and care those we love and members of our churches and fellowships and communities that we have left behind. We pray for our nation. We pray for our troubled world. We pray that men and women of wickedness and evil will be restrained, that peace will prevail, and that your name will be glorified throughout the earth today as it will be on our site here. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. Have a very good morning.